Okay, um, <clears throat> thank you for this award. Um, this is work with uh, my student, Wei Dan Wang, who is now a postdoc at TTI Chicago. So the topic of this paper is optimization of deeply nested systems. I'm going to start by explaining what I mean by uh, a nested system. Uh, you are all used to them. They appear all over the place in computer vision, speech processing, machine learning, etc. <clears throat> and what they do is they uh, apply a sequence of transformations, a sequence of processing stages to the input data in order to achieve some results. For example, in object recognition, uh, you typically have pipelines of the type uh, starting with the pixels, you construct some features there like shift, then you apply sparse coding or something like that, pulling, and eventually there is a classifier that outputs uh, an object category. <clears throat> in phone classification in speech, same thing. Starting from the waveform, you construct features such as MFCCs and then you classify that. Uh, in machine learning, it is not often realized, but uh, we typically have things like that when you do regression, before you do regression or classification, you may want to reduce the, dimensional, the dimensionality of the data, for example. And then typically, uh, one just does PCA or LDA, and then following that, you do a classifier. And that's called a filter approach. Uh, another example of these systems are deep nets, which consist, of course, of a series of processing stages, uh, alternating uh, linear weights and uh, sigmoidal steps, and you do several of those, and eventually, from the inputs to the outputs, you get some, some kind of result. So what all these systems uh, have in common is the fact that mathematically, they construct a nested function. <coughs> the function uh, has parameters at each layer. The parameters are indicated uh, here by W1 for the first layer, W2, the second one, etc. And what we want when training such a system is that ideally we would like to optimize some objective functions such as the, the classification error uh, over all the parameters at all the layers. <coughs> the problem that this has is that constructing systems in this way, even though it is very uh, intuitive and, and can work very well, leads almost always to non-convex problems. <clears throat> and the reason is that when you compose functions, even if they are convex, then typically you end up with non-convex functions. These are much more difficult to train, uh, and this is what this work is about. It's about presenting a, gener a general strategy to optimize uh, nested systems easily and efficiently. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to give a brief review of uh, the main ways that we have currently to train uh, nested systems, which have been used uh, for the past uh, uh, years, the, the obvious way is that you just go and compute the, the gradient. <clears throat> the gradient in a nested system is con constructed by backpropagation, that is applying the chain rule uh, layer by layer, in that example there, with two layers. And then with that gradient, you just feed it to a nonlinear optimizer and live with that. For example, gradient descent or Newton's method or whatever. So theoretically, this is the obvious way to go. But in practice, it has some problems. <clears throat> Firstly, you obviously you need differentiable layers in order to be able to compute and backpropagate the, the gradients. Uh, if you have them, then the gradient is still a problem to compute usually because it is complicated. You have to code it and then you have to debug it, and that can be a pain. Uh, when you do have the gradient, you still have to feed it to the nonlinear optimizer, and it is not so easy to use nonlinear optimization, non convex optimization. There are parameters to set, uh, methods to choose, etc. Uh, when you have done that, then another problem, which is well known in the neural network literature, is that you have uh, vanishing gradients. That means that the gradients of the, uh, some layers in the network are very different from the gradients in other layers. That leads to, it's a very poorly scaled problem. And that leads to ill conditioning. Uh, and therefore, even uh, second order methods will take a long time to, to make progress. Okay, and finally, it is difficult to parallelize backpropagated gradient because by its own nature, it is sequential in the way that it computes the gradients and propagates them through the network or through the nested system. <clears throat> okay, so that's one approach. Another approach is uh, so-called layer-wise or, fi or filter approaches. What these do is basically they are going to fix each layer sequentially, starting from the first one to the last one, in some way. And uh, this is fast and easy, but it is suboptimal <clears throat> because it is not optimizing the correct thing. Uh, examples of these are the pre-training approaches that have become very popular in the last few years for training deep nets. Uh, and an, another example, uh, also very well known, although sometimes not recognized as such, is the filter approach in, in machine learning, uh, which consists of the following. Imagine that you have uh, an nested mapping, in this case, uh, just with a single hidden layer. And this first mapping here could be reducing dimension, for example. And this mapping here, G, could be a classifier. For, for example, if you want to classify face images, you, you typically do PCA or something like that. And then you learn a classifier uh, on the outputs of the PCA. So the general idea there is that first you train the function f, 
that is called the filter. Uh, and usually you do that in, in some way without even looking at the output sometimes. And then you fit a classifier G using the inputs coming from the, the preprocessing, from the filter and the labels. So this function F can be seen as some kind of fixed preprocessing or feature extraction stage. It's decoupled from the optimization of the whole thing. And it may or may not work well, but in general it is suboptimal. <coughs> What you would like to do, ideally, is the, what is called the wrapper approach, which is optimizing over F and G to, to minimize the classification error. But this is more difficult for the reasons I mentioned before, and it is less frequently done. So these are the two main approaches. <coughs> there is another thing you need to do uh, when training an nested system, which is to select the model. That means that in the case of the neural network, for example, you have to decide how many hidden units you're going to use in each layer how many filter banks in a speech recognition uh, pipeline, et cetera. And the, the usual way of doing this is that you, dis you are going to try a certain number of functions, a certain number of hidden units, for example, in each layer, or a certain number of values for each hyperparameter. <coughs> You're going to do a grid search there, and then uh, that's going to lead to a combinatorial number of problems. Each one is a nested problem. You have to train a nested model for that particular choice, and then when you have done all that, then you pick the best, according to some criteria. <coughs> And of course, this is uh, in practice, in practice uh, intractable, and usually one ends up doing some kind of approximate thing where you uh, just train a few models, pick the best one from there, and live with that. So this ends up being very costly in runtime, takes a lot of work and expertise from the user, and doesn't give you the best solution anyway. <clears throat> okay, so given this uh, context, I'm now going to introduce the, the method that we, inter that we propose in this paper, which we call method of auxiliary coordinates for reasons that will become obvious in a moment. Uh, it's not really an algorithm by itself. It's a strategy to, de to derive algorithms for a given nested problem, uh, like what happens with the EM algorithm. <coughs> so it's more like a meta-algorithm. Um, it enjoys the benefits of layer-wise training that I just described, uh, that is fast and easy steps that reuse existing algorithms for shallow systems, uh, but it converges to the right thing. The iterations that arise from it are embarrassingly parallel. And the basic idea uh, underlying the method is as follows. We are going to turn the original nested problem that we want to solve into a constraint optimization problem by introducing uh, some auxiliary variables there, which are the auxiliary coordinates that I, that I am talking about. And we're going to optimize over those as well. Uh, the way to optimize that, that constraints problem is going to be done with a penalty method. And the penalized objective function itself is going to optimize, to be optimized using alternative optimization. So there are a series of uh, steps to be done before you come up with the algorithm. The final algorithm is going to alternate layer-wise training steps with coordination steps. <coughs> so let's see how that works. Uh, I'm going to, to, to illustrate it, to explain it, using a simple uh, net with just a simple nested system with just um, two functions here, so a, a single hidden layer. We have a function f and then a function g. Think, for example, of g being a classifier and f being some feature extraction step. Um, and the objective function that I'm going to use is this list of squares thing, again, for simplicity. <coughs> so this is what I call the nested objective function. <coughs> you can see that we have here this nested function, and we want to optimize jointly over g and f, which have their own parameters. And we want to find a minimum, a local minimum of this uh, nested function. Um, okay, then the first thing that I said that we need to do is to introduce these variables, these auxiliary coordinates, to turn the problem into a constrained one in an augmented space. So what we do here is, if you look at the original problem, uh, you identify some expressions there in the nesting, and you take them out and make them their own uh, variable. This is the auxiliary coordinate for that particular data point. And then you introduce an, uh, an equality constraint to account for the fact that you replace that. <coughs> So you have to do this for each data point. Each data point gets its own coordinates. And the reason why we call them coordinates is because this can be seen, in fact, as the projection of the original data point n onto some intermediate space, which often is low dimensional, but doesn't have to be. So those uh, set values there are coordinates in that space. <coughs> and they are for each data point. Um, OK, so now that we have this, this problem here, living in this augmented space of the original functions, and the coordinates that we have introduced, then we optimize in that augmented space. At first sight, this looks like it is a more complicated thing that we, that we started with, because in fact, if I give you this problem, most of us would instantly think of eliminating the constraints and putting this, this thing back there, therefore going back to the nested problem that we had. <coughs> we don't want to do that because there are going to be 
some advantages in this uh, splitting that we're introducing. And this problem is equivalent to the nested one. Okay, so now what we do is that the constraint problem, we optimize it using a penalty method. If you're familiar with nonlinear optimization, this is an obvious choice to do. Here I'm going to introduce, uh, I'm going to illustrate it with the quadratic penalty method, but uh, you can use the augmented Lagrangian, which in this case would be ADMM. Instead, the maths just get a little more uh, complicated, the notation, but the, the, the difficulty of the problem optimizing this versus that is going to be the same because all we are doing is adding here a simpler term than the penalty. So let's just focus on the quadratic penalty. You can see that what happens is that the constraints, the quality constraints here, come up to the objective squared, that's why this quadratic penalty, times a penalty parameter mu. And what the, the method does, the quadratic penalty method does, is to optimize this now unconstrained problem uh, over everything, including the coordinates, and driving this new parameter slowly towards infinity, so that the constraints are more and more. Uh, we, are, we allow violations, but those violations have to be reduced as we increase mu. Okay, so after all this, then what have we achieved? Why didn't we do the optimization in the nested model in the first place? Here is again the nested model. The nested function is in here, and what we have done is to unfold this nested function into two parts. It's as if we had cut between G and F here, G gets to go to this part, F goes to this part, and in between there are the auxiliary coordinates that link, link both things. <coughs> so the new objective function that we have here, this one, uh, now has uh, terms, has the parameters of each function, they are equally scaled. They appear both in the same form in the objective. And optimizing this function now is going to go through the space of set, possibly taking shortcuts. And the reason for that is that it allows violations on this. So it is as if you were training the network with layers that are mismatched. And that's okay because you don't care about what happens during the optimization. What you care is that when you converge, this has to be satisfied and then you go back to that. But you, that doesn't mean that you have to go through the original space of G and F, which is difficult because of the conditioning that I, that I mentioned before. <coughs> okay, so now we still have to optimize that. And it is obvious that alternative optimization is the way to go. Uh, we do alternative optimization over the coordinates, given the functions, and then over the functions, given the coordinates. This is the step over the functions, given the, the coordinates. So if I fix the coordinates here, the coordinates set, then you can see that this part separates from that part. That means that each layer of the function separates. And that one is going to be fitting the first function, given inputs x, the original inputs, to the outputs given by the auxiliary coordinates that we, that we introduced. And this one here is going to fit the G function, the classifier, for example, given the auxiliary coordinates and the original labels. <coughs> uh, so this is really a layer-wise training, only that it doesn't have to be sequential. It is, in fact, uh, the two problems are separate, independent, and it can be done in, in parallel. It also doesn't require to use back-propagated gradients. We just need gradients here of G and F, if at all, because sometimes we don't even need gradients in some problems. Uh, and the other thing is that usually you can solve these things by simply reusing existing algorithms. You don't have to go and, and redevelop something because those, uh, those are shallow, uh, shallow functions that typically take the form of a logistic regression or linear or it can be a decision tree or it can be anything that you can possibly uh, solve using existing algorithms. <coughs> okay, so that step is very easy. The other step is the step over the coordinates. And looking at the objective function again here, you can see that the coordinates are separable for each data point. So then what we have is to optimize, instead of a very big problem of size n times the size of the coordinate, we actually have n problems, each one on the coordinate for a data point, which is a much smaller and simpler thing to do. The, the coordinates indeed coordinate the layers. They act as the glue between the, the layers. And if you look at the form of the function that you have to optimize here, you would recognize that it looks like a proximal operator, only that generally it is a non-convex proximal operator, because this, this G function here could be anything. <coughs> the solution usually has the form of a, some kind of projection. And it depends heavily on the, the model, the, the form of the function G there. OK, so ultimately, the algorithm ends up being this alternation of two steps, an M step, which minimizes or trains layers, and a C step that coordinates them. And it is this coordination which is crucial because without it, layer-wise training by itself would not convert to a solution of the original problem. <coughs> I explained the, the idea for this particular case of two functions, but it generalizes to k layers. You can find that, the, the details in the paper. 
you can use various laws, functions, uh, constraints, different penalties, etc. Um, the resulting optimization algorithm will depend uh, on the model that you have, basically, the type of layers, uh, how you introduce the auxiliary coordinates. Again, there are more details on the paper, in the paper about that. And also how you optimize uh, each step. And that's a crucial thing to, to do, because the steps should be fast and should be simple. Um, one can prove under my assumptions that uh, doing this will converge to a minimizer of the original nested problem. And, that, um, and what we are doing is following a path in the space of the parameters, the functions, and the coordinates, uh, which is indexed by the mu parameter, and it, uh, that path converges to this local optimum. <coughs> if you want to design your, your own algorithm for a nested problem that you have, here is the design pattern. Uh, you write the objective function. The nested objective function identifies sub-expressions, turn them into auxiliary coordinates with equality constraints, apply the quadratic penalty or augmented Lagrangian, and do alternating optimization. And then you have to solve the, the steps that you get. It's very similar to deriving a, an EM algorithm. Here are some uh, experimental results. This is with a neural net. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details. You can find them in the papers. In the paper, but <coughs> basically, you can see that this red curve here is the algorithm that we are proposing, and it takes very deep steps. So each iteration, each marker here is one iteration, and it decreases very quickly the objective function, and then it slows down, which is typical of alternative optimization. Other algorithms here, the markers indicate uh, 20 or 100 iterations. So the iterations are uh, much weaker. This, uh, this curve here is what happens when we parallelize that, which I will describe in a moment. And the blue curve there is if we use stochastic steps within the W step and the set step, and that curve uh, there that can be barely seen is the parallelization of the mini batch uh, Mac algorithm. <coughs> okay, so um, I don't want you to get the impression that this is just for neural nets. It applies more generally. Here is an example with an SVM. What we do is we want to find a nonlinear feature extraction and then apply a linear SVM. This is the objective function that you will have. It has constraints. There is a nonlinear stuff in the constraint there, which is nasty to optimize. But if you apply these ideas, then you end up with an algorithm that alternates fitting a nonlinear regression on f by itself, a linear uh, SVM by itself, and then the set step actually comes out here in closed form and has a very simple equation there. <coughs> so just update the coordinates in that way. Okay, another thing I want to describe, there are two things I want to describe before finishing. One is model selection and the other one is the distributed optimization. Uh, it turns out that we can actually do model selection on the fly with this, uh, with this strategy. Uh, model selection criteria like BIC, etc. Uh, what they do is basically they count the number of parameters in your model times something. And they want to minimize that cost together with the cost of the nested problem itself. <coughs> and the interesting thing here is that this cost does not depend on the coordinates. It depends purely on the number of parameters. Therefore, it depends only on the sum of the number of parameters over each layer. It separates over, layer, over layers. So when you apply this to, you apply the the MAC idea to this problem, what happens is that you end up having the optimization over the, the penalty, the model criterion uh, cost, it ends up landing in the W step only, and it separates there. And that allows you to do model selection directly on each layer on its own. That means that instead of having to do a grid search of an exponential number of nested models, which is the usual uh, way to solve this, what we do here is a polynomial number of models, each of which is shallow. And we can do that not at every iteration, we can do that every now and then. So the, the algorithm is actually searching not just in the parameter space, but also on the space of architectures uh, itself. Here is an example of that. <coughs> this is an, auto, an autoencoder with a decoder here, which is a radar basis function, and, another, and an encoder here, which, uh, which is another basis function, radar basis function network. Uh, we introduce coordinates here only in the bottleneck layer. And what we want is to determine how many hidden units to use here and here. So if we have something like 50 choices here and 50 choices there, that would be 50 square models to try. And uh, we don't do that here. It teaches, in our teaching step, we just try 50 here and 50 here. And you can see that what we are doing is optimizing over a certain architecture that we start with here. This is the number of hidden units. And then at some point, we do a model selection step, which changes the architecture. You keep optimizing that, etc. So the architecture may be changing every now and then. Uh, and then you continue optimizing that particular architecture. And the thing is that you are always decreasing the, or the original objective function. So there is no heuristic involved here. <coughs> um, finally, I wanted to uh, describe the distributed optimization advantages that we get. The, the algorithms that arise from this model uh, 
tend to have a significant amount of, of uh, separation and, and that is good for parallel processing. In the W step, the layers are always going to separate. And furthermore, each, in each layer, the hidden units typically separate themselves because they appear quadratically in the objective. So that means that for a, for a neural network, in the W step, the vector uh, of each hidden unit is going to be a separate subproblem. So you can have a lot of uh, independent subproblems in there. And then in the set step, as I mentioned before, uh, the coordinates separate over data points. So that usually is a massive uh, parallelization. And that is suitable for large scale data. Here we have uh, some results uh, for the experiments I described before uh, using the multi parallel processing toolbox. We have two 12 processors and we get a reasonably uh, linear speed up there. Uh, we can do much better if we use distributed uh, optimization. Uh, so um, I will conclude here. Uh, the idea that we have proposed is a meta algorithm intended to optimize jointly a nested function over all of the parameters at once. And what it does is restructure the nested problem in a certain way uh, that leads to a sequence of iterations, each having a lot of independent problems. <clears throat> so the algorithm can be seen as a coordination minimization algorithm where the M step minimizes or train layers, usually reusing algorithms that are already there. And the C step coordinates those layers, and that step usually has to be solved for your particular problem. But usually it is simple and sometimes comes out in closed form. <clears throat> and then the advantages are, as I mentioned, that uh, perhaps most importantly, like what happens with the EM algorithm, you end up with really simple algorithms that iterate calling existing algorithms over and over. Uh, it converges, it is embarrassingly parallel. I didn't mention it here, but you can see some papers uh, coming out probably in the next few months where we uh, study uh, cases where the functions are non-differentiable or even discrete, the layers, and it can do model selection on the fly. So given that uh, or lots of us are using this kind of nested models in machine learning, computer vision, NLP, et cetera, I think that this strategy could be widely applicable. <coughs> uh, thank you. Are there any questions? You've described how to parallelize the algorithm, um, um, but it still seems to be sequential in um, uh, adapting mu, right? You basically want to uh, push this uh, um, um, uh, trade-off parameter to infinity. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, have you thought about parallelizing that as well? I mean, sort of along the lines of uh, a parallel tempering scheme? Uh, no, I hadn't because I don't know how that would work. So the, the mu parameter, usually the reason why you don't start with very high mu is to avoid the ill conditioning that quadratic penalty methods introduce which is not, uh, I didn't mention, mention that here, but uh, you cannot just start at a very high mu. So you have to follow the path. It's a path following method. You have to follow the path, and that has a certain sequentiality to it. You have to start from where you were before uh, so that you can get to the next point uh, reasonably efficiently. Otherwise, you just get stuck. Yeah, so I don't know if that can be parallelized itself. Yeah, so along the parallel tempering scheme, maybe we can uh, speak about that uh, offline. Uh, so to run basically several simulations in parallel for different mu values and then jump between different uh, mu values in a parallel could tempering scheme. That? Hmm? Could, could you repeat that? Uh, that you basically run different uh, uh, schemes for different p uh, mu values in parallel and then jump effectively between different mu values uh, right. parallel according to yeah, the parallel same tempering. Thing. Same thing. I, so that question would be a general, a general thing to, that applies to quadratic penalty and augmented Lagrangian methods in general. Um, again, the, the reason why we follow the path is because we have a previous iterate that was near the path. We increase mu, so now we want to go farther down the path, and we use that as an in initialization. So if you don't have a good initialization, you may get stuck in this kind of methods. That, that is why there is the sequentiality of, uh, it's a warm start, basically. Thank you. Okay, uh, any further questions? Okay. So let's thank uh, Miguel again.